Hello, and thank you to the Micella Foundation for the kind invitation to speak to you today about advanced MRI measurements for the treatment management of brain tumors. My name is Kathleen Schmeinda. I am Professor of Biophysics and Radiology at the Med As background, I have shown here the treatment paradigm for an adult brain tumor. It consists of a timeline of the various treatments the patient might undergo, and also the corresponding imaging to evaluate the tumor and the response to treatment. The timeline starts with the patient presenting with symptoms, then an MRI is performed to establish an initial diagnosis. Often the patient will go to surgery for tumor removal, and then another MRI is performed to determine the extent of resection or how much tumor has been removed. Commonly, this is followed by chemotherapy plus radiation therapy and continued MRI exams to determine is the patient or tumor responding to therapy or might there be recurrence. If there is recurrence, there are other treatment options, including bevacizumab or Avastin, chemoradiation therapy. And then again, this is followed by MRI exams to again assess whether or not the patient is responding or is there tumor progression. Recently, tumor treating fields have been added to this treatment options, both for newly diagnosed tumors and for recurrent tumors. So for the standard diagnostic MRI that I've been speaking of, um, we get beautiful soft tissue contrast between the various tissue types in the brain, as shown by these various types of images that show either edema or swelling around the tumor, or they show bright signal from the ventricles. And on this T1 image, you see what is considered to be a mass effect or something abnormal. Typically, contrast agent is then injected, a gadolinium chelated contrast agent, after which you can clearly see where the lesion of concern is located. However, the standard information does not give you specific information about the basic tumor growth patterns. Basically, for any tumor, it starts out with a small multicellular clump of cells that grow and multiply. In order for it to grow beyond a size of about two millimeters, it has to co-op neighboring vessels or actually create its own vessels, a process called angiogenesis. And this is a constant cycle of growing cells, growing vessels, something that we can't specifically measure with our standard MRI measures. And therefore, we have developed advanced MRI metrics such as perfusion MRI. So it looks at the perfused vessels throughout the brain and diffusion MRI, which actually gives us information about tumor cells. So I'm going to talk about the context of that treatment paradigm. Specifically, I'm going to talk to you today about blood vessel mapping, which we refer to as relative cerebral blood volume. Then also a method that we've developed to better delineate the extent of tumor. We refer to this as our delta T1 map. And then taking these two types of images together, we can create something called fractional tumor burden map which gives us a measure of tumor versus treatment. Treatment paradigm, let's start by looking at that initial step of diagnosis surgery. Well, that RCVV metric actually can be useful in helping to guide diagnosis and surgical biopsy. Specifically with RCVV, we've shown that it correlates with tumor grade or how aggressive the tumor is. The higher the vascular dimension, the more aggressive the tumor is. So this is, gives us confirmation that this metric is actually very relevant and important and informative. Also, if you look here on standard imaging, you often can't tell you know, where the tumor is most aggressive. It can look very homogenous. But if you look at the RCBV map, you can clearly see where there's a hot spot of vascularity. And then the surgeon would want to biopsy that particular area to get the most accurate diagnosis. Then after surgery, you want to know how much of the tumor was removed. Because the more tumor you can remove, the better the outcome or the prognosis for the We've developed a method to actually more precisely indicate that area of resection. And there's a, you know, some registration and mathematical algorithms we apply to get this very specialized map called a delta T1 map that shows enhancement much better than standard imaging. And what I mean by much better is 
it's not confounded by some bright signal that you often see on the image that you acquire before even injecting contrast agent. So these delta T1 maps can help us in delineating. This is an example of how delta T1 can be very helpful in determining resection extent. This is an example of a 13 month old. And this, these are the images before surgery. So the post contrast T1 plus C image clearly shows the tumor. The pre contrast image also shows the mass effect and the delta T1 clearly delineates the tumor. Post-surgically, though, it's very difficult to discern the post-contrast from the pre-contrast image since there's so much bright signal in the pre-contrast image due to remaining blood products because of surgery. So you don't really know how much of the tumor has been removed or how much is remaining. And this is where the Delta T1 maps can be very helpful as shown here. Clearly, almost the entire tumor has been removed, and this is very helpful with the planning of the subsequent treatment. So in summary, as this first step of the treatment paradigm, the value of advanced imaging is that the RCBV maps can inform diagnosis, give you some indication of how aggressive the tumor is, guide tissue sampling, you know, guide the biopsies towards the site of the tumor that looks to be the most aggressive, and then with our delta T1 maps to delineate the extent of resection. So important uses of biomarkers. Then the next step is chemotherapy plus radiation therapy or possibly tumor treating fields. And again, we monitor looking at the MRIs, trying to determine is the recurrence. Well, there's limitations with standard MRI, and one that's become quite well known called pseudoprogression, which stands for false progression. It basically describes the inability to distinguish tumor from the effects of treatment. And an example of this is shown here in the middle. This is a patient, a 39-year-old with a glioblastoma, and this is immediately after surgery or post-resection. Four weeks later, after the chemo radiation therapy, it looks like things are getting worse. The enhancement is increasing. The area of the flare signal showing the edema is also increasing. So there's great concern that this actually could be tumor progression. However, when this person went back to surgery, and the tumor, this area of enhancement was removed, it was mostly necrosis. So this area was clearly not progressing tumor. It was actually just due to treatment effect. So this was a clear case of pseudo. This is another, another example of this phenomena of pseudo progression. Here's a patient also treated with a chemo radiation therapy. And you can see looking at that post contrast image, it looks like they're definitely having some continued and possibly increased enhancement. For this reason, this patient also went back uh, to surgery and the biopsy came back as negative. Now, if you would have waited uh, some months later, you would see that the tumor did regress. So it's a tricky, it's a very difficult, confounding question for the treating physicians with regard to pseudoprogression. Specifically, if you could confirm that yes, it is pseudoprogression, well, then you continue the current treatment plan. It's probably going to work. If it's not pseudoprogression, then you might want to change the treatment plan. You might want to stop the current treatment, go back to surgery, or start a new treatment. So, having some sort of measure of whether it's tumor versus treatment effect is greatly important. And also, this knowledge is really important in order to enroll patients on clinical trial. So this is where RCBV can also provide some really important information on pseudoprogression. And this is an example of, again, with a patient that was treated and you have three different areas of enhancement. If you look at the corresponding RCBV map, there's one area with a high level of RCBV and not so much in the other two areas. In fact, the tissue confirmed that this was true progression, and these other areas were pseudoprogression. So here's a good indication that RCBV can be very useful. However, the question is, what is the level of RCBV that's going to make the distinction between tumor progression and treatment effect? You don't have to worry about. To try to get at that answer, we performed a study where we correlated 
um, the areas of tissue biopsy, so the tissue from a particular area, and we correlated that with the measurement on the imaging that we would get. Okay, so this is a, a, a tissue validated uh, measure of our RCVV. And from this, we're able to determine what threshold on these RCVV maps can help make the distinction between what's truly and what's treatment effect. And that's shown again here with a particular case showing the area where we captured the image to see where the biopsy location occurred. And then we match that with our standard or advanced imaging. And using this, we're able to show that our RCVV information could statistically distinguish between tumor and treatment effect. And that's indicated by these values here. And this confirmed a previous study also performed by Dr. Leland Hu at Mayo, at Mayo Clinic in Arizona to also show that RCVV could be used to distinguish the post-treatment radiation effect from the glioblastoma multiforme, the high-grade brain so using this information, we can take our delta T1 maps plus our RCBV maps. And so within the delta T1 region, look at the threshold of RCBV and create what we call fractional tumor burden maps. So the, what this tells us is within the area of enhancement, the areas of red are tumor and the areas of white are treatment effect. An example of using, using FTB is shown here for a 32-year-old female with a glioblastoma multiforme. And shown here again is uh, the image after gross total resection. She was treated with chemotherapy plus radiation therapy. And you see here this new enhancing lesion. So the question of it is, is it recurrence? Is it pseudoprogression? And if you look here a couple months later, it looks like it got even worse. So again, how much of this is tumor? How much of this is treatment effect? Well, if we create our FTB maps, we can see that 30% of that enhancing lesion is tumor, but 70% is pseudoprogression. So having this knowledge of how much of this enhancement is actual tumor can be very, very relevant in terms of the treatment decisions that are made. Here's another example of using fractional tumor burden. This is the same patient, again, with the 30% tumor voxels. We can see that the outcome or the overall survival for this patient was greater than 40 months. For another patient, their FTB showed that 98% of that enhancing lesion was tumor versus treatment effect. And their overall survival was much less. So what these examples show you is that fractional tumor burden is giving clinically relevant, important prognostic information that cannot otherwise be gotten from standard. Here's another example of the utility of fractional tumor burden maps and how it can help to guide resurgery. Here are images that were obtained in this patient before surgery, but four months after chemoradiation therapy. So it looks like the tumor is clearly progressing. If you create or collect the FTB maps, you can see that there's uh, varying regions of tumor shown in the kind of red-orange and the treatment effect, the blue. So this patient went back to surgery and you know, all the tumor that could be removed was. However, there's two areas that could not be removed because of location and these corresponded to areas of high fractional tumor burden. These are areas over time, you see that in these two imaging slices, 17 and 18, it's those areas that showed a high fractional tumor burden that actually were quite aggressive in growing over time, both in the top and the bottom. So this is another validation of the clinical relevance, the information that can be gained from our fractional tumor burden and how it can help guide resurgery and then the management, the treatment management afterwards. Knowing that you didn't get all the tumor, you know, what would the treatment be compared to if you thought you got all the tumor? It and then if we look at the numbers, the numbers we do um, in terms of understanding whether or not a marker is, is relevant or not. And this is what's called a Kaplan-Meier survival curve, and it looks at overall survival. 
So basically, it, says, it shows you how many patients survive over a certain amount of time. And here we see that if the fractional tumor burden is greater than or less than 75% of the entire enhancing lesion, there's a clear difference in the overall survival that's predicted. Fractional tumor burdens have also been evaluated in this study performed at Stanford that also showed that it was very informative in terms of clinical decision making. And then more recently, another study was done at Mayo Clinic in Arizona to again prospectively validate with tissue biopsies the method of creating. So the newer advanced MRI methods that we have in place now, as I mentioned, are the the methods, the relative cerebral blood volume method to give a, a, a map of blood vessels throughout the brain, the delta T1 method that gives us the true tumor extent that's not confounded by other areas of bright spots due to blood products, and then together they give us our tumor versus treatment effect within the enhancing lesion for the tumors that have been treated with chemoradiation therapy. So these methods have been shown to be with these previous studies and examples that I showed you to be very relevant in this time frame of the treatment of patients. Now what about at recurrence? So as I mentioned at recurrence there's several different treatment options including bevacizumab or Avastin, chemoradiation therapy, and also tumor treating fields. And again MRI, standard MRI is used to assess is it response. Well here's an example of a patient with a recurrent tumor, a recurrent glioblastoma or anaplastic astrocytoma that was treated with bevacizumab. And this image shows 75 days and 193 days after starting treatment. And if you look at the standard MRI, it looks like they're definitely improving because this area of brightness, this enhancement is decreased. However, if you look at our RCBV maps, we see a different story. It looks like there's a growing degree of vascularity. And this actually was more consistent with this patient's clinical course, and that sadly she expired just a couple of months after exam. We also do our quantitative evaluation of RCBV in the context of predicting response to Avastin. And we collected RCBV before, 20 to 60 days before starting Avastin or Bevacizumab. I use the terms interchangeably. And then again, 60 days after. Um, uh, receiving bevacizumab. And we look at the change in RCBV and see is it predictive of how well the patients respond to bevacizumab. And in fact, that is the case. So if you're both your pre and your post Avastin RCBV are low, you have the best outcomes in terms of overall survival. But if they're both high, so it looks like the bevacizumab isn't having as much impact, well then it's the worst overall survival. And then there's a mixture of survival depending upon the levels of RCBV. So again, a study to show that RCBV can help predict response to bevacizumab and then may help your physician determine is it really the best drug. Um, RCBV was also evaluated in a multi-center clinical trial. And this shows the results of that trial. And these are patients also treated with bevacizumab, uh, recurrent glioblastoma patients. And the measurements were made at week two and week 16 after starting bevacizumab. And again, confirms the idea that RCBV is useful because when it's decreasing, best overall survival compared to if it were increasing. And this was true with measurements made again at weeks two and Also, what was very helpful in evaluating these patients, the patients on bevacizumab, was our delta T1 technique. So in this case, you can see before contrast agent, there's bright signal. And this is due to the treatment effect of blood or proteinaceous material that causes the bright signal. And then after contrast agent, you see more signal because of the contrast agent. However, it's really difficult to determine what's true enhancement and what is this confounding T1 stuff that we see. And this is particularly challenging in patients treated with bevacizumab because bevacizumab also has the effect of decreasing the levels of enhancement after contrast agent. 
However, with our Delta T1 map, it makes it really clear where the enhancing lesion is. And this is helpful not only for the treatment evaluation, but also for the, <clears throat> the radiologists who try to draw the area enhancement. We also showed in the same study that Delta T1 helps with monitoring treatment. In fact, it could be an earlier indicator of progression than standard imaging. Here you can see progression already at week 8, which is hard to discern on standard imaging, and then was confirmed at week 16. And this is reported in a paper um, analyzing this multicenter. We find it actually is very helpful on a daily basis with monitoring our treatments. So here's an example of a pre and post contrast T1. Again, sort of hard to see that enhancement, but Delta T1 makes it clear. And that, in fact, was the response of the neuro-oncologist who said, take a look at this person's MRI from yesterday compared to his prior one in May. The T1 with contrast is hard to interpret, but I think the Delta T1 says it all. And then goes on to help decide the And then we also have as options to Now what I want to present to you, we're just beginning to understand the usefulness of these biomarkers for evaluating tumor treating fields. And this just shows another marker that I have not yet presented, and it's based on diffusion-weighted imaging. And with diffusion-weighted imaging, we actually can be sensitive to the cell density or the number of tumor cells in a given area. And what this particular slide shows is just the study we did to validate that relationship. So again, looked at the areas where a biopsy was taken and then registered those to images on our, our MRIs and then counted cells. And you can see the cell density varies throughout these different types of tumor. It's basically the density of the blue areas, which are the cellular nuclei. And with this, we were found that the apparent diffusion coefficient, which is determined from our DWI, uh, versus cell density was inversely co uh, correlated. So we can use this information to actually map the distribution on our images as shown here. And this is in a patient uh, treated with uh, tumor treating fields or Optune therapy. And we can see that before Optune treatment, there are some clear areas of lower diffusion, which means more tumor cells. And then after Optune treatment, there was higher diffusion, so more yellow, more red, which indicated fewer cells, and this patient was responding to treatment. And Optune therapy is a therapy that has been shown to actually have some really important uh, uh, promise in terms of prognosis for patients with brain tumors. The difficulty with tumor treating fields is it's hard to tell if a patient is responding till at least five months later because you have all these sort of other things going on, you know, with inflammation and so forth that really confound your standard imaging. So our hope is with the advanced MRI metrics that we can actually see tumor response much earlier than standard imaging. And this image here gives you one indication So again, back to our treatment paradigm and summary of what I've shown you so far is that throughout the treatment paradigm, these advanced imaging metrics can provide some very important information to help with the treatment management. Of course, at initial diagnosis, we can create the RCBV maps that give you some indication of how aggressive the tumor is, which should help with surgical planning. Um, we also want to know resection extent, where the delta T1s can give you a more clear delineation of remaining tumor. And then the fractional tumor burden is something that we're just beginning to explore in this context also. These maps can also help in terms of trying to distinguish between response and recurrence. Again, RCVV levels can show if there's remaining vascular tumor. Delta T1 to show you where the true enhancing lesion is. And FTB, I think, is one of, going to be one of the most important biomarkers to distinguish tumor from treatment effects. We now will, won't be confounded by that phenomena of pseudoprogression. And then finally, in the, in the stage of recurrence, where there's a lot of treatment options, but not a lot of understanding of which one will really work best for a given patient, we're hopeful that these imaging biomarkers can also help predict which patients will respond best to a given treatment and also provide information to the treating physician much earlier than standard imaging does at this point. 
So I talked about the applications of these imaging biomarkers, but I want to say just a few words about RCBV itself and the technology development. Um, only because sometimes when you hear people talking of these different uh, biomarkers, you might get the response that, oh, it's still in development, that people provide images that are give you so much variation in the information. And I just am here to tell you that that's no longer the case. We have been working on developing this technology for over 20 years, and we think we got it. So just to give you a little bit of that background, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into how these maps are created. So when we, um, the information we used from MRI to create RCBV maps is um, something called dynamic susceptibility contrast MRI. So basically what that means is you're collecting high-speed images over time. And if you looked at an individual voxel, you'd see this transient of signal decrease as the contrast agent passes through the vessels. And then we uh, do some mathematical transformation to get a measure that's more directly proportional to the amount of contrast agent in each voxel of the tissue and do some additional post-processing, so apply some mathematical algorithms to get accurate maps of relative cerebral blood volume. We can also get other measures such as cerebral blood flow, mean transit time, but the one that we found to be most useful in brain tumor patients is relative cerebral blood volume. So many years of proving and validating. Um, many studies were also done in the preclinical models to validate this technology under various conditions. Again, we did some clinical studies um, in patients to again validate that it's giving us accurate and useful information and something that was featured in a local paper, local hospital paper, that was of tremendous help to this particular patient because it, it caught his recurrence sooner so they could change faster. This is one of the studies we did in patients where we actually compared the other available techniques that were out there at the time. And we found the technique that we're using at the Medical College of Wisconsin was best at distinguishing high-grade tumor from reference brain. And that's what we want. We want to detect where tumor is and how aggressive it is. And so this is the technology we've been using and that we use to you know, develop the methods that I've been speaking Point. Also validated this technique in several clinical trials. The one I mentioned was an Akron 6677 trial, but it's also a couple more trials and a currently active trial. And so we really know that it works well under many different um, institutional settings, uh, MRI, scan. Still, we have a lot of information that we feel we had the best uh, technique out there. Um, but in 2014, uh, many brain tumor societies came together, including the Micella Foundation, and said, okay, we have to come up with a final answer, a final national consensus for DSC MRI or the method to create relative cerebral blood volume maps. And part of this effort was a working group to look at relative cerebral blood volume. So part of the efforts of this working group was to look at all the data available and then also look at the results of what was recently developed, something called a digital reference object. So it was essentially a very sophisticated computer model to see what is the best combination of acquisition parameters and post-processing methods to give you the most accurate RCBV maps. And it was beautiful to see that actually the computer simulations also came up with the answer that the technology that we are currently using was still the most accurate and the most robust. However, what, what was really nice about the simulations is it also came up with a potential second method that used less contrast agent, 50% less contrast agent. Yet we still wanted to collect the data to prove that this was a case. A computer simulation is only as good as its assumptions. So we collected the data in patients comparing the two different techniques. And we found, and these are the data plots basically showing that this single dose technique matches the robust, what we call standard double dose technique, to an excellent degree. There's a really good equivalence here. So if someone does not want to use um, a double dose of contrast agent, they can go to the single dose, even though the simulations did confirm our standard 
double dose method still is the most robust and clearly the most accurate, this is also a potential option. And this was written up as a paper um, entitled Moving Towards the Consensus DSC MRI Protocol. And this is for the final national consensus protocol that has just been accepted for publication in the journal uh, Neuro Oncology. And what I have highlighted here are some parameter settings, which you don't have to read, but basically confirming exactly what I've been telling you throughout this talk in terms of how we collect and analyze this data. I thought that's important to show you to just to sort of prove that we do have an accepted way to collect this data. Um, really, you know, narrowing down in terms of uh, there's not a lot of variation. You can be comfortable in that what we're providing is a national consensually proven method. So again, these are the methods that uh, I have demonstrated to you in both our application and the technology development to be um, very well understood, validated technologies, the relative stream of blood value to give us maps of blood vessels throughout the brain, the tumor extent to give us true enhancing lesions so we know exactly where that enhancing lesion is. Yet with this, we still don't know in a treated patient how much of this is remaining tumor and how much is treatment effect, and that's why we create our fractional tumor burden maps that can make that distinction, what's tumor in red and what's treatment effect. So we have great hope for this biomarker to really shift the paradigm in the treatment management of patients. I have several funding sources and many people to acknowledge, too many to even include here, that I mentioned, and now I will take questions. So one question that has been uh, proposed is the following. Is this technology experimental or is it available now? If a patient wanted to get it, how would they go about getting it? So I'm happy to say the technology is commercially available for routine clinical use. And patients can ask their doctors about obtaining the software from a company Imaging Biometrics. Now I'm affiliated with Imaging Biometrics. But everything I spoke about today is available um, through their product offerings. Um, another question, for these types of scans, do you have to do MRIs on all one machine, or can you compare them from one MRI machine to another? This is an excellent question. Um, that's the beauty of RCBV and the way we've developed this technology and is that it's, we like to say, uh, platform agnostic. So it can be acquired on different field strengths, the different strengths of magnets. It also can be a, um, collected on um, any vendor that's out there, Siemens, Philips, GE, and you can compare them. And this was validated also with, the, with our clinical trials because the clinical trials uh, accepted data from all of these different platforms. And so the software that we developed automatically accounts for differences in images acquired on different machines. So we can do the comparisons. And again, so it doesn't matter uh, which MRI machine or strength of MRI system that you use. All right, a third question here. Could um, the diffusion maps be used to target radiation therapy? And has it been done yet? Um, so the diffusion definitely can. It's still a little bit under development. But what I know, um, what I'm hoping to see explored to a much greater extent are the fractional tumor burden maps that I showed you, where you can clearly see this is tumor and that's treatment effect. So if a person were to undergo radiation again, maybe they'd get a boost dose in that area. But we're also exploring areas outside of that enhancement where you might have infiltrating tumor. And that's where measures like diffusion, we hope, will also help in that regard. That aspect is still a little bit more exploratory, though. There's not um, a product out there that, that's ready to use. And then final question I have here is, can you reconstruct these new views from old DICOM images or do you need special views so it has to be done at the time you get an MRI? 
So the um, platform that we used, um, and the one I showed you is from Imaging Biometrics, it accepts all standard DICOM images. So DICOM is the standard MRI format. Um, so even if they were collected long ago, it can process that data. Um, one thing I should specify is you need to collect that DSC data to create RCBV maps. Um, and so um, if that was collected at the time that the MRI study was done, absolutely, you can create the RCBV maps as I have shown you here today. So I hope this was instruct instructive and helpful to you, and I wish you well, and thank you for your